Welcome back to Savvy Psychologist. I'm Dr. Ellen Hendrickson, and every week I'll help you meet life's challenges with evidence-based research, a sympathetic ear, and zero judgment. Heads up, parents, as evidenced by this week's show title, this episode is about sex. So maybe break out the earbuds for this one or wait until the kids are asleep. Now, if you ever go looking for sex advice, you are sure to be inundated with tips on positions, techniques, and whatever else the grocery store magazines say is guaranteed to drive your partner wild. But that's not really what you need. Indeed, if you are unsatisfied with your sex life, you're probably not looking to recreate the grapefruit scene from Girls Trip. Instead, you need some sound advice for your most important sex organ, the one between your ears. Thankfully, this week, Dr. Steven Snyder is here to help. Dr. Snyder is a sex and relationship therapist in private practice and on the faculty at Icon School of Medicine at Mount Sinai in New York City. He's a frequent guest on major media and a regular contributor to Psychology Today and the Huffington Post. His new book, Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship, turns sex therapy inside out to discover the hidden secrets of desire for committed couples. So, Dr. Snyder, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ellen. Of course. I'm really excited to talk to you. So I realized that over four years of doing the show, we've actually never done an episode about sex. And so who better to help remedy that than, than you? So I'm really glad you're here. And I saw that, um, well, I know that you've been in practice for over 30 years. And so I'm sure you've helped about a zillion couples, you know, give or take a couple million. So over all those years and people, what are the patterns? Like, what do people come in for? And I, my question is, what are some of the biggest obstacles to yeah. good sex? And of course, how can we get around them? Okay. As a sex therapist, you see the things that you'd expect. Um, people who can't climax, uh, people who can't get hard, uh, couples who for some reason have some uh, uh, difficulty with the process. But the biggest thing, especially in this decade here in the 21st century, is people reporting that the sex they're having is just not doing anything for them, that it's just not good sex. Hmm. Um, everything works. He gets hard. She gets wet. They both have climaxes, but afterwards they go, eh. And as a consequence, they don't desire it. Mm, mm -hmm. So the question comes up, the obstacles to people having better sex than they're actually having. And I would say the biggest obstacle in my 30 years experience working with, I'd say, uh, that 1,500 individuals and couples over the 30 years is climax, hmm. orgasm. I always joke that we sex therapists are the only people on the planet who are not concerned with orgasms. The reason for that is that everybody who comes to see with us, see us, is downright obsessed with orgasms. So I always tell people, think of sex as like uh, a, a restaurant. You got your hors d'oeuvres. Let's say, let's say that's foreplay. Okay, makes sense. Ideally, you don't want to be thinking, let me just get these hors d'oeuvres done so I can get to my main course. Mm. In a good restaurant, the hors d'oeuvres are really good. You're really, one might say, in the moment with the hors d'oeuvres. And then there comes a point where your main course comes around and you go, oh, I forgot. There's a main course, too. That's the way you're supposed to be, right? Because you were so involved with the hors d'oeuvres. And now you go, we get to have a main course. Oh, fantastic. And then you reach the conclusion of your main course and you're almost full. And then the dessert tray comes around and you go, oh, I forgot. There's dessert, too. It's like, oh, my I'm gosh. Just, yes. I love this place. <laughs> so that's how sex should be, ideally. Uh, it should be foreplay, which you should enjoy for its own sake. Mm -hmm. um, I always say the, the mnemonic should be Fios, like Verizon Fios. Ah. For your own sake, F-I-O-S. And then... The main course for most couples, that's intercourse, but it doesn't have to be. And you just want to enjoy that for its own sake and be in the moment with it. And then afterwards, you want to have an orgasm? Fine. It's just dessert. Don't obsess about it. But that's not how most couples are doing it. 
most couples are going to bed to have sex just to get dessert. So they want to get him hard, her wet, so they can have intercourse or whatever it is. Then they can both get dessert and they can go to sleep. And afterwards, they wonder why they're still hungry. You know, you wouldn't want to go out to a restaurant just to have dessert. I mean, you might want to do it once in a while, sure. but not, not make a habit of it. So uh, the first problem is that couples get so focused on just doing the deed to get a climax that they forget to really be in mm. the moment okay. uh, during sex. And in the moment is really where all that good stuff happens. Right. So so is it that people are rushing through or is it people are just not kind of noticing hors d'oeuvres in the main course? Or it's Great. a combination of the two? It's both. It's both. One, they're rushing through because like everything else, they want to do it efficiently. And, you know, it's, it's, our, it's, our, it's our millennium. Um, and the second thing is that they really don't pay attention to whether they're aroused or mm -hmm. not. This is something I talk a lot about in my book. Masters and Johnson in the 1950s and 1960s talked about the physiology of arousal, how hardness and wetness happens and that whole thing. But the psychology of arousal is much more important. Unfortunately, the psychology of arousal hasn't found its Masters and Johnson yet. Nobody's really studied that. Mm. I've had to rely on his anecdotes over many, many patients who've talked to me. And when I've listened to patients talking about what it feels like to be aroused, which are, most people say there's never nobody ever asked them that question before. Right. And they describe, you know, it's a little bit like being hypnotized. Hmm. Um, I lose track of time. I lose IQ points. I get dumb. I, you know, if, if I boil it down to the essential of arousal, I get dumb and happy. And there is a particular quality, which you and I know as psychologists, we talk about it as a regression. Mm, mm -hmm. Great sex is a regression to a more infantile state of mind. And in that infantile state of mind, we don't really care about anything. We may be deeply involved with our partner, but we don't really want to hear about all the problems they had during their workday that day. We just want them to make nice noises and tell us everything is wonderful. <laughs> so true. <sighs> so what most couples do, unfortunately, is they assess their level of arousal and their level of their partner's arousal by whether they're, them and their partner are hard or wet. But one might say if arousal was on a scale of zero to 100, for most reasonably healthy people, to get hard or wet, you only need about a 20. And you don't want to have sex if you're only at a 20. Oh, interesting. Then you want to wait till you're at a 40. And a 40 means you've actually lost some IQ points. So you really don't really know what's going on so much and you're not as coherent and you're regressed to a more infantile state. You're a little more impatient, perhaps mm. the phone rings. You don't really care who's calling. You just want them to go away. And <laughs> um, by the way, this is one of the reasons that a lot of women, especially women with children, have difficulty with arousal because couple be making love and there'd be a noise in the child's room next door. The woman's arousal immediately goes to zero. Oh, absolutely. She, yeah. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. There's, there's noise next door. The guy's arousal does not go to zero at all. He goes, ah, it's fine. It's fine. They're fine. And no, but she says, no, I heard someone say mommy. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Child's knocking at the door. Woman right. says, let's find out what's going on. The guy says, ah, let him go away. You know? <laughs> so the main thing um, is to pay attention to arousal. And that's what most couples don't do. They don't pay attention to the psychology of whether they're really aroused or not. They pay attention to the book, physiology. The psycho yeah, in my okay. book, I put the psychology of arousal at chapter one. And it basically involves, are you really absorbed in the moment? Are you losing IQ points? Are you regret regressed to a more selfish, infantile state? And finally, do you have that deep sense of validation that most people have when they get really, really aroused, where they go, oh, yeah, 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 this is, this is where I really live. Yeah, mm. this is me. Yeah, yeah, this is me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Finding me. Oh, God, yes. Yes, yes, yes. And by the way, that's why people who are uh, gay and lesbian, but just a little bi, um, a little bisexual, they can mechanically have sex with people of the opposite gender just fine. I mean, most people describe, yeah, I tried it a couple of times. Everything worked. Yeah, I got hard, wet, whatever. I had a climax and everything, but it didn't do anything. Mm, mm -hmm, it, it, mm -hmm. That deep sense of validation that goes, oh, yes, yes, thank you, thank you. Right. It wasn't It wasn't like, oh, I'm home. Oh, this is right. Yeah. I'm okay. Home. Okay. Exactly. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. I, 
was, it's like it's like the salmon swimming upstream to the lake where they were right. spawning. I mean, right. going, oh, yes, this is the place. Okay. Okay. So, okay, this is so interesting because, like, usually, so you're talking about psychology, which certainly, you know, is my cup of tea. But, like, usually when when we look for information about, like, how to keep the spark alive or how to have great sex or you look at any, you know, cover of a woman's magazine, oh, my gosh, we find the headlines are all about either technique or, like, how to give him pleasure, give her pleasure. Like, tell me about that disconnect. Is technique and pleasure the right track or not so much? Great question. It's a great question. If we're talking about techniques for giving your partner pleasure, i.e. the cover of the magazine, 10 ways to make him scream and right. beg more, right? Right. Techniques for giving your partner pleasure. There are two things wrong with this. The first is technique. And the second is the word given. Ah, do tell. Okay. So what does this mean? Technique has a goal. Mm -hmm. Trying to do with your techniques. Are you trying to get your partner hard or wet or give them an orgasm? As I mentioned before, the sexual mind is fundamentally infantile. Mm. It lives in the moment. It's about being, not doing. It just likes to get dumb and happy, and it doesn't really understand goals at all. If you give it a goal, it has no idea what you're talking about. It just goes, da 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 it gets bored. Um, so all these books about how to give your partner the greatest orgasm, I can tell you from what I hear in the office, it just leads to a lot of really boring sex. No, it sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. It's a lot of work and work as, as I say, and I have a whole chapter on this. Um, there's a great quote from one of my favorite sex authors, Wendy Stragar, um, where she quotes, she says, once in a while, she'll get a text from one of her teenage kids, friends, knowing that she's a sex expert. And one of her favorite texts that she got from a guy says, does fingering even work? <laughs> I can't imagine that coming up on my phone. That would be a hilarious text. <laughs> um, and the problem with the structure of that question is that it has the word work in it. Mm -hmm. Does it work or not work? That's the problem with technique. Um, it has to do with whether something works or not. Does this work? Does that work? Oh, my God. Let's forget it. You don't want to think of it. You know, the sexual the infantile, you tell an infant or a, or a young child, you are going to give you some work to do. It has no idea what you even mean. Right. Here, use this technique. Like, what? No. Yeah. I don't understand. Yeah. And I just want to, you know, like wear a party hat and stuff my face with ice cream and have everybody go, yay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So no technique. So what's the alternative? So what, what, what instead? First problem has to do with technique. The second has to do with giving. Ah. The sexual self, being infantile, has no idea what giving means. It just wants to take. Mm. Okay? So infancy is one of those rare times where you get to be enjoyed just for being who you are. Hmm. So think about it. To, to really take an out there image, um, well, I promise you we'll bring it around to sex eventually. A mother of a newborn enjoying her baby's feet. Hmm. Okay? She's kissing and holding the feet and enjoying the scent of the baby's feet. She's not trying to give the baby pleasure. Mm. She's taking pleasure. Mm -hmm. And yet the baby, if all goes well, is having a formative and foundational experience that the universe is taking pleasure in his or her existence. That's really, really profound. That's what we really want during sex. We want to feel that the universe via our partner is taking pleasure in our existence. We just want to be enjoyed. Think of romance novels. No hero in a romance novel ever rips the heroine's clothes off and says, okay, now tell me how you like to be touched. Right. <laughs> no, he just enjoys her because she's so delicious and he's waited for a hundred pages to enjoy her. <laughs> and now he has his chance. And you see people, largely women, who flip through these books, they're flipping through the pace. Oh my God, oh my God. You know? um, the fact that he's taking such pleasure in her. We don't get to do that with each other other than when we're infants. So it's a regression to this magical state where we're enjoying our partner and they're enjoying us too. We don't have to do a damn thing. Which is so and is such an antithesis to the the prevailing notion of that people have to perform or that that we have to to you know, do something to impress them, which just which is just stressful. And you and I know there's no mystery to that. Right. The reason that sex advice tends to have to do with goals and techniques is you can commoditize these things. Ah, yes. Okay? You can sell them. Mm -hmm. How to? Real passion, you can't sell. 
You can't commoditize. It's a gift. It's either there or it's not. Mm-hmm. Passion is selfish. And what I tell couples is sometimes you'll feel passion. Sometimes you won't feel that much passion. What you're basically doing is you're looking for it. You're looking to find it. And when you find it, it has to be honest. You can't create it. You can't commoditize it. You can't just go on a sex vacation. You can't just make a sex date. It has to come naturally. And that's the mystery of it. Well, that's th- that's a perfect segue, because I wanted to ask you about conventional wisdom says, you know, to keep the spark alive, we have to prioritize. And so you mentioned a date. A lot of couples will do date night, assuming that that will lead to sex. Other couples, you know, will schedule sex. Like, is that totally off the wall? Or like, what, how, how do busy couples make time for sex? What do you recommend? It's a great question. Let's see here. If you ask most sex therapists, they'll say, absolutely. Schedule sex. Put it on the calendar. What happens is it leads to a lot of bad sex. Ah, okay. Because it's like scheduling a reservation for a restaurant, but you're not hungry. Ah. I mean, if you don't eat for eight hours, you're going to be hungry. If you don't have sex for eight hours, you're not necessarily going to be hungry. So you get to the restaurant, and you're not particularly hungry. That's a problem. So what I recommend, which I talk about in my book, is something I named the two-step. What it does is instead of making a date, to have sex, you make a date to go to bed together, take off your clothes, and do absolutely nothing. Hmm. So just a little time together to do absolutely nothing together. And what this is, is this borrows from the mindfulness movement, Mm. which, you know, has uh, literally set fire uh, to psychotherapy. Mindfulness is is really the, the new third wave in psychotherapies. And it has to do with accepting things for as they are, or as the mindfulness uh, people say, pay attention in the moment without judgment. Yes. As my mindfulness uh, teacher once said, pay attention in the moment without judgment. Yeah. Good luck with that. <laughs> so we are human. Sure. Pay attention in the moment with as little judgment as possible. There you go. Or if you experience judgmental thoughts, just notice them. Let them be and see if they just go away. As the Buddhists say, let your thoughts come into your home. Don't serve them tea. So a judgmental thought comes into your onto your thought like he doesn't like my thighs or like she doesn't think I'm big enough or something like that. And you just don't serve it any tea. You go, oh, yeah, yeah, my mind it just does that judgmental thing. Let's just see what happens next. And if you don't get all emotional about it, usually those judgmental thoughts, they don't get any tea. They just get bored and they go somewhere else. So somebody who's listening to this podcast, say, say they try this. So they, they get naked and they lie down next to their partner. And so the, the thought, shouldn't we be doing something? Or what, what's next comes into their head. So what, what happens after this? Just notice that thought. Okay. Hey, doing something. Well, actually, the mind has two basic modes. Uh, one is doing and the other is just awareness or being. Mm. So should we be doing something? Absolutely not. As the Zen Buddhists say, Don't just do something, sit there. (laughs) Yes. So you're in bed with your partner, and let me show you how this is done. You lie there, and you're aware that you're breathing. Okay, well, that's interesting. You're not usually aware of of breathing. So let's just notice the breath going in and out. Um, If you're fortunate enough not to live in Manhattan, then you can actually see sky through your window. Um, You just notice the color of the sky. You notice the temperature of your body in bed. Notice your toes and your feet and your hands, and you just be in that present moment. And there's something for most of us that's welcoming and pleasant about being in that present moment. We don't make a big deal out of it. You're just there. And at that point, you've shifted gears. You're no longer in doing state, and you're in a state of being. Now, that's step one. Step two, now that you're in a state of being or as close to a state of being as you're going to get, then go ahead and let yourself experience arousal in whatever way it comes to you. If it's your partner's touch, if it's the sight of a part of your of a partner's body. Um, I say that as I'm stumbling on this because I'm a guy. For a guy, it's usually the sight of your part of your partner's body. <laughs> and if it's uh, <clears throat> the sound of their voice, mm-hmm. because you can certainly talk during a two-step, 
Um, you just talk about this and that, try not to get too involved in any deeper, heavy conversations and try not to get involved in any major decision making or anything. Mm-hmm. But just chat, just hanging out, you're just talking. And for most people, that's a, a tremendous relief. Mindful sex, which is what you're going to then do in part two, is a little bit like mindful eating. In a mindfulness course, somewhere around the second or third week, you do a mindful eating exercise. It's primary. It's fundamental. It's done in almost all mindfulness courses. You take a raisin and you move it around on your fingers, rub it against your lips, put it in your mouth, but don't chew it and just experience it and experience the foreignness and strangeness and uniqueness of that particular raisin. You do the same thing with your partner's body. And this approach draws on something that Masters and Johnson discovered in the 1960s when they invented their sex therapy techniques, but it's less involved. It doesn't take many, many, many sessions. Their sex therapy techniques, just like mine, were all had to do with paying attention in the moment without judgment. And it can have a tremendous uh, restorative effect for a couple. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I suggest. So now what does all this have to do with desire? Well, the traditional model is that desire leads to arousal, leads to sex. The model here is that mindfulness leads to better arousal, which leads Hmm. to desire. A little bit the reverse. It's like you just want that wheel to start turning. So, and the way to start turning is by having a quality sexual experience. It doesn't have to be the greatest sex of your life. It's just one where you felt in your body a little bit more, a little more regressed, a little more dumb and happy, a little more selfish, and a little more absorbed in the moment. And if you had an orgasm at the end, that's great. If you didn't have an orgasm at the end, that's fine, unless you really feel frustrated, in which case, feel free to give yourself an orgasm. That's fine. I always joke if you're in a restaurant, that's like just like going next door to Agadas. You know, you <laughs> go, go get your own dessert. Go get it. It's fine. It's fine. <laughs> um, and it's not a big deal. It's just dessert. And if you're lucky, you had a quality arousal experience. And it's those quality arousal experiences that most of us remember when we remember really, really good sex. Most of us don't remember orgasms because they're like momentary. Who can ever remember what an orgasm felt like? But arousal, we can remember what that felt like. And it's the memory, that Pavlovian memory of my bed, my partner, good arousal that creates desire. You know, Picasso said, inspiration is nice, um, but when it comes to me, it finds me working. And similarly, you wanna say, Desire is nice. When it comes to me, it finds me in bed with my partner. And then you get to have that good meal. Exactly. Exactly. Desire desire comes as a consequence, not as a, as, a, as a first thing. So I don't like this idea of firing up desire or stepping up desire or all that. I think it's garbage. Um, the, the, the real key is to have a quality arousal experience and, and have good sex. That's what that means. And that means sex that really made you feel good about yourself in that kind of good validation kind of way. And that creates desire. Well, that makes perfect sense. Okay, so this is all in the bedroom, but what about outside the bedroom? What can couples do when they're not lying in bed naked next to each other to help keep that spark alive and stoke the flames? Absolutely, absolutely. Here it is in a nutshell. Outside the bedroom, they can do the exact same thing. We said that inside the bedroom, they were enjoying arousal just for its own sake. Outside the bedroom, you can enjoy arousal for its own sake. Uh, With with a few more clothes on. With a few variations. First of all, you're usually vertical rather than horizontal. Second of all, your clothes are usually on. Right. And third of all, usually you don't have as much time. So man is leaving for work in the morning. His wife doesn't leave for work for another hour. She's going to take care of the kids first, wait till the nanny gets there, whatever. Instead of kissing her goodbye, he can let himself get a little aroused just for a minute. In sex therapy, we call this simmering. Hmm. It's not boiling, it's just simmering. Just a little low heat. Simmer. Instead of kissing him her goodbye, he can simmer her goodbye. I'm going to say this again. Instead of kissing her goodbye, he can simmer her 
goodbye. Reach around, hold her around her waist, bury his face in her hair, inhale her scent, kiss her cheek, her neck, have his arm naturally tighten harder around her waist, and enjoy feeling a moment of arousal. Now, if he's like most men, this will feel good. And if she's like most women, assuming it's a heterosexual couple, it'll feel good for her too. There's no demand on either person to do anything or to experience anything than exactly what they're experiencing. If all goes well, they both lose a few IQ points during that minute, and he leaves, she's there, and they both feel a little bit buzzed. Hmm. It's that state of feeling momentarily buzzed that keeps the erotic climate at the right temperature in a relationship. Most couples make the mistake that they only really allow themselves to get psychologically aroused in that, quote, dumb and happy kind of way when they're in bed having sex, which is ridiculous. Hmm. You want to be able to feel arousal with your partner every day, all through the day. Instead of kissing your partner good night, simmer them good night. A little holding, a little feeling, a little inhaling their scent, breathing together, and then you go to sleep. And it's that taking of pleasure. It struck me when you're talking about the simmering of goodbye or the simmering of good night. There's no attempt to give the partner anything. It's it's taking. It's selfish, but it works. It's like mother and a baby's feet. Mm-hmm. Um, it's just find something that you enjoy and enjoy it, whatever it is. And that in turn makes the partner feel good. Usually, because we all like to be enjoyed. Yeah. So the masters of simmering are teenagers. Ha. Huh. Okay. Take a couple, boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm sorry about all these hex heterosexual images. Um, but I figure that's 90% of all couples. You take a couple, boyfriend and girlfriend in high school. They have three minutes between classes. Mm. They meet at one of their lockers. They hold each other, they inhale each other's scent, they breathe together, they hold each other a little more tightly, they both feel excited, then the bell rings, and they go to their classes, each feeling a little buzzed, Mm -hmm. and unable to concentrate on what's going on for the next 10 minutes. (laughs) That's what you want. That's a great example. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, So that's really the heart of it, is don't save arousal for just when you're in bed having sex. Enjoy arousal at other times too. You know, a lot of women get worried about this. They think, what if he gets hard? Because a lot of women feel, if he gets hard, then I'm responsible for doing something about it. Right, then there's an obligation, right. Absolutely, like, like, okay, I was in charge of him getting hard, uh, so I have to make sure he has a climax. Now that's ridiculous. I'm a man, we men, we like being hard. Uh It makes us feel really good. And A man doesn't necessarily have to have an orgasm every time he has an erection. And so women have to know that if they're indirectly responsible because they're just so alluring, if they're indirectly responsible for their partner getting hard or excited, they don't have to do anything about it at all. He doesn't mind. He doesn't mind. He likes that. He likes that. Good. Well, Dr. Snyder, this has been so illuminating and so helpful and you're just a joy to talk to. So on behalf of everybody listening, thank you so much for helping everyone's sex life. And thanks for being on the show. Dr. Snyder's book, Love Worth Making, How to Have Ridiculously Great Sex in a Long-Lasting Relationship, was called by Dr. Christiane Northrup, quote, the most practical, fun, and empowering book I've ever read on how to have a fabulous sex life in a committed relationship. You can pick it up, wherever you like to get your books. Thank you for making Savvy Psychologist a part of your life. Here at Savvy Psychologist, we are always looking for ways to make your life better. So please, help shape the future of Savvy Psychologist. Do you want to hear more interviews and guests on Savvy Psych? Or do you prefer the monologue format? Do you like a wide variety of tips? Or would you rather hear a deep dive on one or two? Let me know at bit.ly slash Savvy Psych Feedback. That is B-I-T dot L-Y slash Savvy Psych Feedback. B-I-T dot L-Y slash Savvy Psych Feedback. 
Or if that's too much to remember, you can just click on the link in the episode description in whatever podcast app you're using. The survey is only four multiple choice questions and can be done in a matter of seconds. So thank you so much in advance for making your voice heard. As always, Savvy Psychologist is strictly for informational purposes and doesn't substitute for mental health care from a licensed professional. Thank you so much for listening. Have a wonderful week. And of course, I will see you here next week for a happier, healthier mind.